Now, I want to go through again, we, I want to go through again another, some of the bizarre things about Hashanah. Okay, I try to explain again some of the deeper meanings of what's happening in Rosh Hashanah. We'll talk about some halacha, but I also want to explain to the deeper meanings of what's going on. So, first of all, I just want you to see in your siddur in a second, because sometimes you're lost in the davening because it's kind of long. And I mentioned it last, but I want you to see it inside. Now we have that we have the machzor in front of us. So, really, as far as the prayer goes, and this. Rosh Hashanah, you know, there's different holidays where if you could jump between becoming Sparty, Ashkenazi, Hasidic, you want to jump into certain ones. Like, you, like you don't want to be Chabad during Pesach. You, you, you <laughs> might have a bag. You don't want to do that. If you could be Sparty for Rosh Hashanah, it's a good one because they skip everything. It's basically, they're like in and out. They don't have what's called the Piuti. Piuti are like all the additional prayers that we say, the Sephardim don't have that. They, they're like, shh, they're in and out. So Ashkenazim take much longer, but in the morning service, all that's really added is the piyutim, piyutim are, 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 are songs. They're beautiful, and we sing them, I enjoy them, I'm being sarcastic, I really, they're great, and we have great tunes for them, and they're, but that's not, it's not like the central part of the prayer. I mean, the person skips those Songs, they still fulfill their obligation of prayer. That's why you'll see sometimes I skip some of them. You know, I'll see if it's too too long, I'll skip one or two because they're 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 additional things to get you connected. But you know, you don't have to say each and every one. So that's in the morning service. And the morning service really kind of is the regular standard morning service in the sense that you have the you know the the, the Shema, you have the Shema Esrei, you have the repetition, you have the Kedusha, you have reading the Torah. And the middle part of Rosh Hashanah is adding the, these, these songs. But if you look in Musaf, in the, in the additional service, that's when the changes really happen. I mentioned it last week, but this is a crucial part. So, what happens in the Musaf? The first thing that happens is the shofar blowing. What page okay? do you have Shofar blowing is on page 432. I have to start blowing the shofar. Okay, we do one round, one set of shofar blowing now, which is on page 432. We're about to go to the Muslim service. We start out with a set of shofar blowing. Now, what we're going to see is that really, once you did this, you fulfilled your obligation of shofar blowing. What we're going to have to explain is why we keep blowing the shofar so much. Because we're going to blow it now, we're going to blow it later, and then we're going to blow it later. Okay? We're actually going to make a hundred sounds of the shofar. When really this first set of 30 sounds is sufficient. Okay? We're going to see why we do that. Okay? We blow the shofar now, and we're going to blow it again later when the reader repeats the Shimon Esrei. Okay? So it is, if we start out, we blow the shofar, and then we blow the shofar a second time when the reader repeats the Shemona Esri, the Song of Prayer, and then we blow a third time at the end of the davening. Okay, so let's, let's see this now. Okay, so we blow the shofar once. Now, I want you to look, skip around to we get to the Musa. <laughs> let's skip now to we see the reader repeats the, the Musa. Well, even our Musa, even our, our Song of Prayer there. If you look there, if you look in your Sidurim, look on page 454. Which, uh, which, which part of the service are we at? This is the Musaf, the additional service. It's our silent prayer, our Shemun Esrei, and the reader's Shemun Esrei also. In both the cases, we're going to do this. You see on page 454, you look at the page, you want to see it there? You're in the translator one? Oh, maybe I, no, I have the right non translator one. You have a translator one? Yeah, that's why I was asking. Well, I'm on Hebrew then? In Aline? Oh, that's that. But these are all translators. Yeah, you're in the right place. Oh. The, the, uh, um, I think that both of them are all translators. Translator translator. The one says, oh, you have the sorry, it's translator. Are they all translator? Yeah. All the ones that I like. 
Let me give you that. I'll give you the page in there. Let me see the page in there. You need to work through both of them at the same time. Give, can you give Hillary another transliterate? The non transliterate is on page 454. I think it's around. And that's all I knew. I think it's around. No, it's not exactly uh, It's kind of a lane. We'll see in a second. 634 ish. Right. Oh. Page 634 in the red. Oh, very good. <laughs> and the so, also blue. Yeah, so um, it's going to be on page 646 in the transliterate. If you have an OU on yours, it's 646, okay? Okay? Not 6, it's not, it's 454. What? I can probably. Okay, good. So now, if you look there, you say, what's that? Alainu, Alainu, I know Alainu, but that's not exactly the Alainu that you know. It's the same words, but it's for a different purpose here. See the introduction, it says kingship. Okay? This is the first part of the additional service to say Hashem is the Melech, God's the king. And we say the Alainu because the Alainu talks about God being the king. It ends with, on that day, Hashem will be the king. Right? You know, that God will be the king, and God is one. It says, the Neymar, we said, by Hashem Melchaklaritz, that God will be the king over all the earth. So if you look throughout this whole thing, we're saying verses, basically ten verses about God being the king. That's the, the, that's the point here. Okay? Look on page 456. That thing could be in the, uh, uh, in the other book, it's probably the next page, two pages later. You'll see in the, in the English it says, in your holy writings, the following is written. Mm -hmm. Okay? Because the first one we say three verses of God being the king from the Torah. Then we say three verses of God being the king from the prophets. Then we say three verses of God being kings from the, the uh, um, the, I'm sorry, the writings are first, the two vim, right? That's, that's uh, Psalms and Song of Songs. And the three verses that says God is the king from the uh, prophets. And then we repeat one from the Torah. Middle of page 650. 650 and 457. So this is the first crucial part of the Musa, to say God is the king. And we say ten verses from both the Torah, the Bible, the Nadi and the prophets, and the Ketubim and the writings <coughs> to say God is the king. Now, the next part is on 458. And in the other one, yeah, it's 654, six, right. <laughs> and now it's called remembrances. And again, the same process, we're going to say 10 verses of remembrances. Okay? Three from the, four from the Torah, three from the prophets, three from the writings. Okay. That's the second part of the Muslim. Mm -hmm. And then the third part is, if you turn to page 462, it's shofra, shofra blasts. 662. Six, six. six what? It's going to be page 663, yeah. yeah. Chauffeur blasts. We say 10 verses about the chauffeur blasts, okay? And this is the central part of the Rosh Hashanah Davine, is to mention kingship, God being the king, remembrances, and show for I'll explain it. We talked about it last week, I'll explain it a little bit more deeply in a different way today. Now, so we blew the show for first. Okay? Then what we do is we, we say our silent prayer. We mention king ten times. Remembrances, show for ten times. Now the reader repeats his silent prayer, Shimon Esrei, and he does the same thing. Kingship he mentions, and he has some more some more songs in there about king, probably the king. Verses about ten verses about remembrances, some songs about remembrances, ten verses about the chauffeur, and and then the uh, uh, um, songs about the chauffeur. But the additional part is when he, he completes each one of those three sections, he blows the chauffeur again. Okay, he makes another round, and, and in each section, another round the chauffeur blows. Okay, he blows a total there of thirty sounds. So that means. We blew 30 sounds in the beginning. We say to Shimon Esrei, mentioning kings, remembrances, and chauffeur. Then he repeats it, and then he blows throughout his solemn prayer, another, his, his repetition of the prayer, another 30 sounds, 60 sounds. And then at the end, we're going to make another 40 sounds, at the end of, the, of all the davening. It's 
equal 100. Okay? That is the form of our service, okay? That's the form. Now, I want to explain to you the problems, because there are a lot of problems here, okay? Let's get some of the problems. First of all, what, what is the, what, why is it so important to say God King, remembrances? And the Talmud says like this, it says you've got to say God's the King on Rosh Hashanah, and you've got to mention the remembrances. And through what do you do that? Through the sound of the shofar. Those are the three sections. Say God's king, say remembrances, and say them all through the shofar. Why is it so important to say these three parts? That's one thing I want to try. I said it last week, I want to say a little different today. Okay, that's question number one. Okay? Question number two we need to understand is, is blowing the shofar. Okay? And this is going to sound very wild to you. I mentioned this a couple weeks ago. But in Torah law, all you need to hear is really nine sounds. Because there are three places in the Torah where it says, blow on Rosh Hashanah a trua. A trua is a cry. And we have another verse that teaches us before every cry, there needs to be a simple sound first. It's a kia. And a simple sound after. So technically, I could be, I'm sufficient if I just go, do, 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 I do that three times, then technically I've, I've really covered my bases. I should be fine. We don't do that. That's nine sounds. We do a hundred sounds. Well, how do we get to that? And this is going to be important to the halacha too. What happens if you can't come to shul? Right? Women generally, if they're in the shmona, if they're in the community, then they want to hear the whole thing. But very often, what happens is, you is got that what's that? You got to yeah. change a diaper. No, not that. Like you know, or like uh, many times, if you know, a woman's going to give birth or something, then we go, we blow the shofar for them, but we don't blow a hundred sounds. We blow, we blow only thirty, only the the, the, the the set I'm telling you about, the nine or so. So that's what you got to hear the minimum. I want to I want to explain to you why we have so much. Let's let's go through this a second. Just get our, our mathematics here. I, I did this for you once a few weeks ago. Let's understand this. The Torah says you need a cry. Three cries in Rosh Hashanah with a simple sound before and after. But we have a question. What's called a good cry? What's a cry? Okay, is it called gnuche or yulila? There's two kinds of cries. One is the, the, the sigh, the sigh cry. It goes as follows. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I'm not having a baby where we don't get nervous. <laughs> so that is the sigh cry, okay? So according to that, <coughs> you should, all you need to do on Rosh Hashanah is do, 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 do. That's the sigh. Oh, uh, oh, uh, oh. Uh. That's the nine sounds, right? One sound, and then the three is considered one, another one afterwards, three times. Are you seeing the number way I'm doing this? Now, there's another opinion that says, no, 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 that's not a good cry. A good cry is like this. <laughs> right? So according to that one, it should be, do, 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 Right? So to make sure we got it right, we blow one set of tekiya, shvarim, do, 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 tekiya, one set of that three times. Then to make sure we got the cry just right, we do another set of do, 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 three times. That's, that's, that's another nine. Now, According to the third opinion, no, 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 no. A good cry is not just one or the other. A good cry is both. You start out with the sigh, but then you go into the wail. So it's, oh, 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 oh. That's three words, okay? So that's really now actually four sounds because it starts, each one has the simple sound first, oh, and then oh, oh, oh. Two. Uh, three. Uh, four. So you do it three times, that's 12 sounds. You got the math so far? So it's 9, 9, and 12. How much is 9, 9, and 12? 
30. 30. So I understand now why instead of just nine sounds, we make 30. Because we want to cover all the bases of what's called a good old cry. That I get. That I get. But what I don't get is how do you get from 30 to 100? What's that about? We do 30. And then the rabbi said, 30 was good, but 60 is twice as good. So the rabbi set up now that it's not enough to blow the shofar in the beginning of the service. When the reader repeats his whole thing, mentioning the king, mentioning memories, mentioning the shofar, the rabbi said, blow another 30 sounds. Double it. And that's the main thing. The 60 is the main. One is from the Torah's obligation. One is the rabbis adding it. And then they said at the end, you know what? We have a custom. It's not a, a law of the rabbis, but it's a custom to blow up to 100. That's what we added at the end. It's not as important as certain the Torah ones. It's not even as important as the rabbinical ones, but it's a custom. We'll see what the custom is. So we, at the end, we do another 40 sounds. Okay? My question for you is going to be, what the heck is this about? Why, why are we doing this? Yeah, you know? I mean, I like this... I, I like the sound of a shofar as much as the next guy. Very often, when I'm in my house and I want to like relax, I put on shofar music. I have Zeppelin on the shofar. I have I have the Grateful Dead to have a whole shofar album. I listen to like different different shofar shofar you know classics. But but <laughs> you know, it's, it's a new station they have classic shofar. It's like that classic rock is a classic shofar station coming out. <laughs> hundred point hundred point hundred. On XM. What? On XM. On XM, that's right. John <laughs> so, but I don't know, why do we need all the show for blood, John for blood? So now, let me tell you why you need the show for blood. Why you need at least the 30 plus the 30. But when I tell you the answer, you're going to go like this. Huh? Okay, Cliff, can you practice that face me? I got it. Good. <laughs> this is going to be even weirder. When the first sound of shofar blow comes out, the sutton, the force of negativity in the world, gets freaked out. Oh my gosh, what's going on here? What is this? But he's not totally freaked, he's a little bit freaked. He's like, what is this? What's going on? You know, we have a tradition. First of all, when God gave us the Torah, there was this loud shofar blow, as it says in the Torah. We have a possible verse that says, when Mashiach comes in the end, there's going to be another show for blow. And that show for blow is going to get everyone together. All the Jews are going to come, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're going to hear what's called the show for Gadol, the great show for. And the Jews are going to come, yeah, we're back. So when the Sutton first hears the first round, he's like, hmm, could that be the big show for? I don't know. He's kind of scared, not scared. But what he hears is the second round of the show for blow, the second third, he's like, oh no, it's the big chauffeur! <laughs> it's the big chauffeur! <laughs> I'm coming! Sanford. Sanford, so. Someone gets the reference at least. <laughs> so, it's the big <laughs> It's the big chauffeur! And he can't accuse the Jews now because he thinks it's the ultimate chauffeur that God's going to blow in the end of history and everyone's coming back and he's like, I can't go and, and accuse them because that's it. It's over. The game's over. God is already redeeming the Jewish people, and I'm finished. I'm dead. You think he'd catch on every year? <laughs> now, come on. Now, you know, I, I, I might not be the brightest light bulb in the, the group, I know. But I think after a couple thousand years, I might get it. You know? So I don't get it. Every year, every, I mean, it's like so weird. What, the whole, first of all, what does this mean? The rabbi has set up two times to blow because the sun's going to confuse. Come on. I mean, the sun, the sun, he's a very, very smart, smart uh, spiritual force. He's an angel. You know? He's not, uh, he's not an ADD medicine. He's with the program. You know, he's like, he's following. He's, He's, he's been, you know, he's, he's trained. He's trained for this. He's got his act really together. He's refined. Now, so he thinks the second one is the great chauffeur. And then, in the end, what happens is he makes the same 
the stake every year? Is that, is that really what we're saying? I mean, that, that, that's a little hard to, hard to imagine that one. A little hard to understand what that means. So that's my second thing I want to discuss with you. Now, the second round of Shofar Blows, by the way, just to show you that they're called in the sage. The sage is called the first round sitting Shofar Blows. Sitting Shofar Blows, because you could sit during them. <coughs> now, of course, you've noticed that no one sits during them. Okay? <laughs> so, so they're called Shofar Blows that are seated because technically you could sit. I don't know. If someone has the guts to just actually sit I'm gonna do that. during his, <laughs> I would be surprised. Because no one does, and when we went to mitzvah, but technically they're called the sitting ones because you technically can sit. The second round, which happens during the silent prayer when we're saying Shimon Esrei, or the readers repeating Shimon Esrei, are called standing because they're in the middle of the prayer. Okay? So one is called the, 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 the sitting one, one's called the standing one. Okay, I'm going to explain today why you need both, okay? And why one's called sitting, one's called standing, maybe a deeper meaning. And the last thing I want to maybe try to understand with you now is, we mentioned last week a very strange law that on Rosh Hashanah we do not mention sin. I, 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 got, I got trouble understanding that, really, really, real trouble. Because the rule in Judaism is, is that you, you do not want to be a fake at all. I tell my kids, listen, you know, I, most mistakes you could make, you know, that's fine. But if you don't come straight and clean with me, that's something that's, that's, that, that one is going to be serious. Okay? If you lie to me, and then, my kids know that. There's like, there's a, a certain place where you made a mistake, just say I made a mistake. Don't start giving me stories and this and that, because that's worse. Everyone makes mistakes. I can handle a mistake. But when you start to, you make a mistake and you try to cover it up and you're really okay and you're fine, it wasn't you, it was the dog, it was the, 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 the that's, that's not okay anymore. So what kind of thing is this on Rosh Hashanah? We don't, we don't mention, we don't mention that we did anything wrong. Hey, you and I, God, we're good. You and me, tight. What is, what is that? What is that? Say, I did the wrong thing. Why do you mention sins on Rosh Hashanah? I gave one reason last, I want to give another reason this week. So questions, thoughts, comments, what we said so far. Kind of makes sense, sort of makes sense. It's going to be a very nice explanation of the depth of Rosh Hashanah here. Yeah. When we do the second set of 30, are they in the same order as the first set? Is it an identical set just later in time? Or um, are they switched up? What it is is that we do, we do, uh, um, you know, there's, there's two different customs. So if you want you to look, I'll show it to you here. There's two different customs how it's done. Okay. Our custom is what we do is we do it. Um, I'll show you. So for example, um, if, if you look at uh, um, uh, page five twenty. What we do, the, the custom, there's different customs, but I'm sure what we do is we don't do in exactly the same third order of 30. The order of 30 in the beginning is you do the tkia, just get the word, the tkia is the, is, is the straight one. The shvarim, which means broken, is the three, the three earth, da, 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 right? We do, when we started, we do three of those, then we do three of Takiya Trua, do, 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 and then we do three of the of the of the Shvarm Trua, the, the three into the into the to the, the, the heaving cry. When we do it during the reader's petition, there's different customs. Most people do um, they do a set of all three. In other words, as opposed to doing all the Shvarim, all the Trua, and then all the Shvarm Trua, they do in each round a Shvarm Trua, a Shvarm, and then a Trua. It's a little different order, okay? Good. Any other questions before we try to explain what's going on here? Yeah. Is there something special about the number 100, like in Gamachia? Sure, no, 100 is very significant. Well, we'll see what it has to do here, but 100 is obviously a very significant number in a lot of ways. It's, 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 100 is what, right? And 10 is, is it's an expression of something as whole. Also, so, yeah. you talk about, you know, the satan and, you know, it shouldn't, you know, should figure this out after 2,000 years, and, you know, but the whole thing sounds like an extreme personification of 
a spiritual, internal kind of, you know, force that, like, you know, we're ascribing thought processes to a spiritual force. I, I, I just, that seems a bit... It's so, strange to me. So let me let me let me let me try to explain that, and, and, and you have to understand it. So it's a good question. You know, sometimes when the the Gemara talks, let's say for example, it says, "There's a Gemara that says this person went and he asked the mountains, the mountains answered this, and then he asked the heaven, the heavens answered that." So the morale says he wasn't talking to the mountains. The mountains weren't answering. That was happening. Okay, what it means is this was a logical answer for the mountain. The Maral says the same thing. There's a story when Moshe goes up to the, to the heavens and he's arguing with the angels. The Maral says that the angels didn't say it to Moshe, he didn't say it back to him. But that was what the, the, if they were to speak to him, this is what they would have said. Because it's what the logic dictates. So I don't know what the son is saying or not the son is not saying. But somehow, the process of what we're doing, the process of actually blowing the show for the first time, is somehow causing that negativity that would, that would become, God forbid, accusing us, is, is tempered. And the second set, it's wiped out. And that's what the Talmud says, that although on Rosh Hashanah, God's judging us, when we blow the shofar, he gets, leaves a seat of judgment, by the first set, and then he goes to, 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 the, to, the, to the throne of compassion. So the chauffeur blow actually causes a change in us and in the cosmic world that God judges us favorably, and that's what it means that something can't, can't attack us anymore. It changes how, how we are, how we're perceived, and how we perceive ourselves, and how we are in the spiritual world, and therefore the sudden the silence. The forces that could that could that could attack us are silence and should judge us with compassion. Are the second set of shofar blows in the zichrona zichrona remembrances part of the musaf? Like, are the, is, is it's in the musaf. We do we do it in the musaf. We, he blows one time for the kingships, one time we, at the end of the verses of remembrances, and one time for the end of the verses of the shofar. So maybe something with Hashem remembering like our fathers or just how he'll never he'll never not love us anymore has to do with this mercy that. That supersedes any uh, things we did wrong. Okay. Okay. I mean, uh, uh, yeah. Should, but why, 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 why two chauffeur blows? Which, which, which party can't answer? Just that the first one, for some reason, drives the negative away, and the second one overpowers, like the Shin remembers us for good, and that actually. All right, we're going to see. We'll see. Some, 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 some. All right, let's try to understand this right now. Okay, here comes a rule. Here comes a rule. Okay? It's called Sof Maaseh B'Machshava Tchila. Whatever is your end situation, whatever you would do trying to accomplish in the end was in your thought from the very beginning. So, for example, let's say you build a basketball court. Okay? You put up a hoop in your backyard. Okay? Now, your goal now is to play basketball. You see yourself, I don't know, hanging out with your friends, whatever, and you're playing basketball there. So when I'm playing basketball on the court, what I'm saying is that when I first designed the court was for the purpose of playing basketball. You don't build a basketball court and then say, uh, what do you do with it? You don't do that. No one does that. You don't build anything. Anything that you're thinking, anything you're doing, anything you're doing. Yeah, I don't know, somebody is, 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 is knitting a sweater. They're knitting a sweater because they want someone to wear it. So in the very beginning, they're thinking, I'm making this that someone can wear. Nobody goes and, 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 and knits a sweater and says, what do you do with a sweater? I've never seen one of these before. You don't do that, right? It's always for a purpose. Now, therefore, what was God's purpose in creating the world? Smoke. Let's understand What's God's purpose? So, what's God's purpose is what is called Shechina Matachton, that God's, God's presence will be felt in this world. That you'll be able to, to come to this spiritual level because you're going to be able to sense there's, there's God in the world. You'll recognize there's a creator in the world. 
everything we're going through right now is to get to that point. But in the end, the goal of this reality is to have a reality where we are people, but we are very cognizant and very much connected to God. And we realize He created the world, and we see His involvement in us with us all the time. That's going to be the goal. The goal is that God created a world, and unfortunately our actions kind of pushed away God's presence. But the goal is to create a world where God's presence permeates all of reality. And that's the point. In the end, it's going to be fantastic. Because wherever you go, you're going to understand and recognize that there's God. And you're going to see it. And it's going to be clear. And it's going to be wonderful. It's going to be great. It's going to be the utopia. But that's the reality. That's the goal. Now, because God built the world, and his original thought of the world is on Rosh Hashanah, on Rosh Hashanah is also the day that his goal has to be expressed. Right? You're building, you're building something there, and you're building it with the, your mind now is, I want that point. So when God... And is, creates the world in Rosh Hashanah, the goal is, is that it comes in the end to the fruition of what he wants, that, the, that his presence will be in the world. So Rosh Hashanah is the beginning. Rosh Hashanah is the thought, so to speak. It's where God starts to build it, or builds it, however we understand it. But in the end, he wants to come to fruition. That's his plan from the very beginning. So when does it come out? When are you going to see it come to fruition? It's going to be in Rosh Hashanah. So now watch this. So therefore, according to that, on Rosh Hashanah, what are you saying during the holiday? You know what you're saying? You're saying these things. You're saying, Malchios. Oh my gosh! I got it! I got it! Hashem is the king of the world. I got it! You're bringing the world to its fruition. You're bringing it to the goal. You're announcing clearly. Oh, wow. I understand this world is for God to sh us understand He's the king. Hey, I, I got it today. You're actually sort of reliving the purpose of the creation, right? The world was started Rosh Hashanah, and it started for the goal, and the goal is going to be out of Rosh Hashanah also. So every Rosh Hashanah, you're announcing, I'm here, I got it, I got the goal. Here it is. Malchios. The purpose of the world and the creation from the first Rosh Hashanah to this Rosh Hashanah is to recognize there's a creator of the world. I'm announcing it. Ten announcements. Malchios, 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 Malchios. I'm announcing it. I've announced it. Okay? There it goes. Right. Now, the second one is, I'm going to announce now Zichronos. You know what Zichronos is? God remembers everything. You know what that means? Wait a minute. It's not just that he created the world. He's the king. He's involved everything in the world. Wow, I've gotten to Rosh Hashanah, and now this whole thing is, is expressing itself. I'm getting it. Remember, God remembers, he remembers, he remembers, he remembers, he remembers! He remembers everything. He's involved in my life in every way. So this Rosh Hashanah, what you're doing is you're expressing the purpose of the original Rosh Hashanah. You're announcing God as the king. And you're announcing that he is involved in the whole world. That's what you're doing. How do you do it? For us to remember. For us to remember that, yes, for sure. This way I'm saying is, us, is we got to remember that God is, by us, but, right, exactly. By us saying God remembers, we're remembering He's involved in every aspect of our life. That's right. That's exactly. So, okay, so how do I do this, though? I do it through the blowing of the chauffeur. I wasn't even do it through the blowing of the chauffeur. Let's understand what the, is this show for. This show for is amazing stuff. Okay, let's understand what is man doing through the show for. What is the show for? What is the purpose of the show for? I gotta, I got I'm getting to Rosh Hashanah. I'm getting to the purpose of creation. I'm announcing God as a king. I'm understanding that, that he's, he's involved in every moment of my life. But I gotta do it through the show for. What is the show for? Now, there's a lot of reasons what what the show for does, but the the simplest explanation. What Maimonides says, and this we're going to see is very deep, very makes a lot of sense, is the ultimate alarm clock. It's the ultimate alarm clock. It is the alarm clock that wakes you up. Okay? 
And what happens is God's going to blow the shofar. And, you know, all year long when you say God created the world and God's evolved my life, you know, you're kind of half asleep, you don't know. But when, when, you, when you announce it on Rosh Hashanah, when you've just been woken up with that, do, 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 that ultimate alarm clock of God's voice, so to speak, his call, because he's telling you to blow the chauffeur, so you're hearing his, his call. He's the one who told you to blow the chauffeur, so it's his call. When you get that alarm clock, that wake-up call, then you're going to be able to announce this properly. You'll be able, through the chauffeur, to announce, ah, wow, I got it, today, God's king. Oh, I got it. It's remembrances. Now, it's a little different, this alarm clock, than other ones. Let me explain this a second. Sometimes, you have a husband who gets married, and he thinks he's going to be really smart. He's going to be really smart. He, he, he knows how to handle this relationship. He says to his wife, listen, honey, I, whenever you need something, whenever you want something, you need something, you just tell me. Just tell me. Okay? Thinks he's got it under control. He's very told what he wants. Comes home, first day, second, third day, and then he sees his wife's not, not happy. <laughs> What's going on? What's going on? Just look over the garbage. It's always the garbage. <laughs> always the garbage. <laughs> That's my weak point. <laughs> the husband says, Honey, why, why didn't you just tell me? I already said I would be happy to take it out if you just told me. I hope he says, If I have to tell you, it's not the same thing. You should know yourself. I gotta tell you. I was like, huh? He doesn't get it. What's the wife saying to him? She's saying, if you really cared about me, you would figure it out without me saying it. And the husband's like, ah, I don't get it. How does this work? <laughs> That's what's that? The garbage is different. People should know that it's. Messy. Right. It's not about loving your wife. It's right. about like, messy. You're okay. Right. Okay. 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 Right. So, okay. So, okay. so give me a different example. What example you want? Like if you want a gift and you like, think, oh, I mentioned it like a month ago. You okay. There you go. Thank you. Just paying attention. Thank you. Thank you. So, so, okay. So very good. So what do you want? So she says, I told you a month ago. What'd you like? What was the example? Give me a real example. What did no, I pay, made, made, made example. I always tell my girl exactly what it is. So the wife, the wife wants, wants the gift. But if I have to tell you, there's no point. Okay? Now, is, 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 that, is there any truth to that? Is, that? is that a right way to function? No. No? Are you speaking now as the wife or as the husband? No, it's supposed to say it. No, it is. I mean, it's up to your It's about paying attention, picking up on subtleties. No, but you shouldn't have to be like that. You should ask her. Shouldn't you want, it's like she wants to see that you're internally motivated, that right. that's within you to want to get. Right, so, you, so really the truth just, is. We're created differently. I think we just will never get it. That's right. We're just created differently. That's right. That's right. That's right. For, just will never get it. For men, this is like, this is like I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tall task. I got it. It's a tall task. But <laughs> it's the right task. We just don't, we don't, get, we don't, we always pick up so, so we don't, we don't pick up the clues so fast. You know, like, huh? Yeah. We pick up so fast. But really, that would be a sign that you're so tuned in to what I want that I don't have to even spell, I have to say the words. That's the chauffeur. See, the chauffeur's not words. The chauffeur's not God saying, Okay, wake up, Daddy! It's time to keep the Torah! I'm not saying that. There's no words here. It's, it's, this, it's just this call. It's this call that has no words. It's called a call, a head of alma. It's just, just air. It's just a sound that God's making. So when God gave us a Torah, he blew the chauffeur. He didn't actually blow, but he made the sound of the chauffeur. And that was the call like, hey, Jews, do you want the Torah? And we said, yeah, we really want it. We want it so much that we're not even going to ask what it, what it says. We're just going to do it. You want a gift? Take out the garbage, whatever you want, we're in. That's what we're saying. You don't, got, you don't got to spell it out, God. We're tuned in. We want exactly what you want. That's the sound of the chauffeur. The sound of the chauffeur, like I'm giving the, the Torah, it was, and that's what nations of the world didn't get. Nations of the world were like, uh, and instead of God off from the Torah, they said, uh, what does it say inside of it? Uh, I show up a chauffeur. 
I want to know what it says. I, I got to know if I want to commit myself to this thing here. I don't know if I, if I buy it. Tell me exactly what you want, God, and then we'll decide. We didn't say that. Once we got the, the sound of the chauffeur, once we got saying, God wants to give us something, we want it, no matter what. Now, let's understand what happens now. On Rosh Hashanah, there's two sounds of the chauffeur. One is God's wake-up call to us. That's the first set. When that comes out, we hear it. Wow. And sudden, the force of negativity is silenced. Because it's a little bit scared right now. So wait a minute. There's just a, a, a sound of a, an inner wake-up call that's not even spelled out what God wants, but the Jews are in it. They're sitting there listening to God's, so to speak, His voice, His call. They want it so much. They're tuned in even though it's not been asked and spelled out, just like at Mount Sinai. So he, the Sutton gets nervous. Whoa, maybe there's a problem here going on. Maybe. But then, what he freaks out is once the rabbis come along and say, all right, you, the Jews now, are not commanded to blow back a second round, but you do it because you really want to show that you want this, the husband comes to the wife and gives her the gift, and she says, wow, she takes and she says, you know, here, I want to give you back something even more amazing. That means they're connected. It means it's no longer a one-way street. It's a two-way street. And it's so much so that the Jewish people are now going to blow the chauffeur as a return call. Wow, it's not only God that you gave to us, but, and you woke us up, but we're showing that the wake-up worked because we're blowing the chauffeur back a second time. That's one is called the Sirius of the Law. It's God from above waking us up. And now we, which we don't have to do, we're not obligated to do it. But the rabbi said, do it, because you want to show there's a reflection, just like the face is reflected in the water, the reflection. So to God, show for blow. His call is arousing in us. We want to run back. So that's an amazing line. It says in, in, in the Torah, it says, Mashcheni lecha v'narutza. Pull me and I will run after you. That's a weird thing to say. Why is it weird? Because pull me means I don't want to go. Pull me means like, God, pull me, which means I don't want to go. Pull me and I'm going to run after you. So it's a contradiction. If I'm going to run after you, why do you got to pull me? If you pull me, I'm going to run after you. It's, we need a wake-up call. The wake-up call that God gives is the first sound of the chauffeur. It's that first sound. That wakes us up. That's the pull. But once we get the pull, we're showing that beyond the Torah even commands us, we're going to do more. We're going to blow the show for blowing even another level. And that's why it's the show blower of standing. It's the second set is when we're standing in the Shemun Esrei. We're showing we're praying to God. It's, it's the essence of the person returning it. We're asking God, we need stuff. We need, we need. We, we, we're dependent on you. So the second show for blow is what freaks out the Sutton. Because it's not only that God woke us up, by us dictating, by the sages in the hearts of the rabbis saying, you need to blow a second set, you're showing that you have been woken up so much that you've taken upon yourself to blow another set. That's what's going on. And now watch this, ladies and gentlemen, it's amazing. The reason why the Sutton is freaked out and every year is learned from his mistake is because it actually happened. It, it's not that it may happen. It actually is happening every single year. When we blow the shofar two times, one time Hashem has commanded us, the second time what we want to do, in a certain sense, we're actually removing, we're fighting that Yetzirah, we're fighting that sun, we're actually bringing about the ultimate chauffeur cry, the chauffeur gadol. we're doing it in a miniature version. Every year it's adding up. Every year when the chauffeur blows out once and we repeat it a second time, what we're doing is, it's not that the sun is nurse, oh no, maybe it's the great chauffeur, and maybe it's the end, and then it's not. No, it is the end. Every year that experience is one more notch one miniature experience of the ultimate chauffeur blow. And that's why the sudden is freaked out because every year it's happening. 
when this ultimate show of blowouts happens, when it happens in times of Mashiach, every Jew gets woken up, no matter where you are. You say, I want to come back, I got it, I want to be part of the Jewish people, and, and you come back. That's happening every year on a, on a miniature scale, not on a full scale, but every is happening on a miniature scale. And that's why it's like you can't respond. You can't respond because it's really true. That repeat chauffeur that we do shows that it's woken us up and we're there. And now the last part. Now that also you understand a very deep thing why you don't mention the sins on Rosh Hashanah. Because in the end of history, what God is going to show us, when we get that wake, ultimate wake-up call, it's going to show that everything we did wrong before was a mistake. We were, we were just walking in our sleep. Really, it was part of God's plan, but we always wanted to do what was good. And that means at the end of history, all the sins that we've done for all these years are going to be shown to be not really our sins. They were just part of a grand plan because when we get that chauffeur call and the ultimate in the end, so we're going to say, we, ah, that's what we're about. All this other stuff, we were just, I don't know what we were doing. We were sleeping. We were, we were drunk. So on Rosh Hashanah, when you hear the ultimate chauffeur blow, you don't have any sins anymore. You actually don't. Because what's happening is, by, by you getting that wake-up call from God and calling back, I heard it, there are no more sins. In the end in history, when that ultimate shower blow super sound is going to come, it's going to show that there were no sins. So every Rosh Hashanah, when you relive that, you can't mention sins, because Rosh Hashanah, there are no sins. You're done. You, you heard the sofa sound. You woke up. It's an amazing, amazing idea that we're talking about concepts. So that ties together the whole business. Okay, let's just, just, just tie together and see what we got. The reason why you mentioned the three things, the king, the, the remembrances, and the and the and the through the chauffeur is because Rosh Hashanah is the time where you get to experience the purpose of all the creation. The purpose of creation was to bring God in the world, to recognize God as the king of the world. So what you're doing, Rosh Hashanah, you're announcing, oh I got it now. I got it. God is the king. King keeps mentioning it. Oh, he's involved in my life. Remembrances. He remembers everything. He's involved in every, every part of my life. How do I do it? How do I wake up to notice that? Through the chauffeur. When that ultimate wake-up call happens, that wakes me up to be able to see these things properly. And when I, for my love for God, I want to return it back. I want to say, not enough that you open. I want, I, want, I want to give back to you, like a husband and wife relationship. I'm going to add another round of chauffeur blows. Then I'm saying, I totally got it now. I'm totally woken up. Once you're totally woken up, the sun is shut up because it really is a little portion of that ultimate redemption, of the completion of the universe. And therefore, you don't mention sins because there ain't no sins anymore. You've actually gotten it. That's the idea. Questions, thoughts, comments, ideas on this approach of Rapsodic Recovery. What about so, the last 40? Ah, so what's the last 40? What's the last 40? So, remember we had 30? And then we had 30. That was the rabbi set up. Then the rabbi said, okay, add an extra 40 at the end. And where that is from is like this. It says that there was a battle, the story of Devorah, Devorah and Brock. Devorah was the prophetess of the Jews, she was the judge. And she went to battle one time with, with, with the, the kings, with, uh, with the Canaanites, and she fought against the, the evil general Sisera. And Sisera. Um, in this battle, Sisera gets killed. Okay? And what happens is his mother, his mommy, doesn't know where he is. Where's that little Sisera? He's out. I don't know. He's, not, he's very late for dinner. Where is he? And she starts crying. She says, Oh, where is he? He's not here. He's not here. He's not here. And her friends comfort her by saying, saying, don't worry. Don't be blue. He's fine. You know why he's late? He's out raping and pillaging. <laughs> There's no reason to get upset. He's, he's doing fine. <laughs> and then she starts wailing more. Oh, 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 oh. He's wailing. She said, no, no, no. Don't worry. There's probably another city he found that needed more raping and pillaging. Don't worry. You should be happy. She's nervous, and she keeps crying for her poor sister. And the Talmud says the wailing, the crying that she made, like a chauffeur call, she made 101 sounds. So 
what do we do? <laughs> 102. <laughs> 101 sounds. She made. So she made 100, 101 cries. So what happens is we have to battle her cry. Her cry is a cry of evil. How could a woman take comfort in the fact that her, husband, her son is late because he's out raping and pillaging? It's, it's, it's an evil cry. We take the 101 sounds she made and we make 100 sounds against it to make our cry to God be the pure cry. I'm not sure what you said there. I said, I said a hundred sounds. <laughs> yeah, I, just, I guess it's been a hard class, so I stay on the top, I guess. It's because you're pressed on. I'm not sure what I said either. Really. <laughs> Show you this, I'll, I'll say this again. Uh, but, yeah. <laughs> so she makes 101 cries out for the side of evil. Her cry, <laughs> her cry is like, oh, where's my sister? I hope he's, he's pillaging and raping, and that's why he's okay. So we have to combat that. Our cry has to be the cry of what we said before, the shofar, the shofar gadol, the cry waking us up for God, not the cry that's putting us into this into this muck of, of, of the mother of Sisera. So she made 101 of those cries. We battle those. Now, we don't make 101 sounds, though, because we say even the evil mother of Sisera, she's still a mother, she's still your mom. And your mommy, there's one place, there's one cry that she had that must have been genuine. There's one cry of a mother's love to a child that must have been from just the pure place of a mother's cry. So we don't have to, the one cry that she has, that one aspect of a good cry, of a truthful cry, we don't need to fight that one because everything's got one spark of something good inside of it. And even the evil mother of sister had some place inside that one cry which was, which was genuine as a, as, a, as a mommy for a poor kid. But the other hundred cries, we got to combat those. So we have 30 from the Torah, 30 from the rabbis to show that God gives us the wake-up call and then we have been aroused and we show it works, which freaks the sudden out. But at the end, the world is the world. And the world's got some bad dudes, right? We got these ISIS characters. We got some really bad people in this world who are doing really bad stuff. And we have to, we have to combat that. So we give a hundred calls of goodness and of yearning for Hashem that beats the hundred calls of the side of negativity that call out for evil and terrible things. Good. Any other questions, thoughts, comments, ideas? Sort of makes sense. Some of makes sense. And it was a very deep topic, but I, I and I hope it was comprehensible because I actually. Enjoyed preparing it. It was a famous Rapsodic, it was a PSF out of Rapsodic today. Really a uh, nice idea. But I, I, I think that, you know, we've covered Rosh Hashanah now. I think you can kind of go into Rosh Hashanah with some of the, these concepts here, okay? We talked about some of the laws last week, so some of the concepts here. And, and to understand now the Machsa, what you're reading. What you're reading is you want to think this is the ultimate day. This is a day of where I can recognize God as the King of the world. That's the purpose of the day. The purpose of the day, yes, the day of judgment is true. It's, it's the expression of completion. And it's the day now, take a, take a minute, whenever anything's happening, and say, wow, he's a creator of this world. Wow, I got it. I got it. And sometimes I, I, I close my eyes and I try to imagine, you know, Hashem's, Hashem is, is, is in control of all my being, you know, and every aspect of what it is. And, and, and when I hear a chauffeur sound, I very often I use it as a primal scream for myself. You know, and I'm, I'm calling out to Hashem, yes, I, here's my, I woke myself up, I want to come back. So you have these concepts now, you should put them into your, into your service. Don't let this be philosophical. Bring it into the practical, okay? Think about, you don't mention sin. You mentioned last week the idea that, that we're thinking about what the ultimate good is, not only focusing on our own personal needs. Maybe okay, another idea. You know, I actually say because today is the ultimate day you want to be woken up and you want to show that anything you did before is not really you. You're woken up. Think about that.
Think about the shofar cry and let it wake you up and let it be the call to remove the evil in the world. Use all of these things in davening. Do the idea we said last week about <coughs> Rosh Hashanah is the, is, is the DNA, it's the birthday, and it's, you want to make the day perfect, not in neuroses, but, but in, in, in the idea you do the best you can, right? A person should never say, you know, I want to make the day perfect, I'm going to do everything right. And then, you know, your friend goes and, and interrupts you, you know, during your davening. What are you doing? I'm making this day perfect! I didn't ruin it! That's not smart. That's not smart. That's, take everything with, in, in stride. Everything that happens is what's supposed to happen. So now your friend interrupts you, you smile and you take it. And if you make a mistake and you get angry, get off it. Get off it. It means you made a mistake and you're fixing it up. It's a day to get it right. It's a day to recognize there's a God in the world. He's the Melech, he's the king. He's involved in everything in the world. He remembers and he's involved in every aspect. And through the chauffeur call, that you have, that's, that's your wake-up alarm that God gives you, and you want to show back that you've been woken up, and if you do that, you fight all the negativity in the world, and you actually, you actually are making that part of the perfect day. You are actually making the chauffeur goggle, the chauffeur redemption, <coughs> happen on that day in our level, you know? Questions, thoughts, ideas, yes. Okay, so it reminds me of the parsha a little bit when we bring the fruits and we remember what happened to Jacob in Egypt. So it's like a similar concept perhaps in the parsha. Because why? Because <coughs> um, just when we bring the first fruits that we say, I will power of Yahweh be and Egypt and all this. Like we're, it's like similar to the Rosh Hashanah energy, I think. Like thanking Hashem for everything he's done for us. He's done for us. Yeah. Yeah, but I'm, but I'm saying, but the difference here is that really Rosh Hashanah is, is, is the beginning. You're, you're back and you're back at the start. If we are, you're at the start and you're at the end. You're, you're actually at the end. You're right. When you bring the fruits. You're what you're doing is you're, you're it's your own personal expression of you know that I've gotten these things and I want you to I want to recognize that you're the source of all that. That's that's and that's all davening. I mean the, the bikurim are really. You know, there's a message that says that Moshe saw that Bikurim was going to stop, so he, he initiated prayer three times a day. Because Bikurim is really the aspect of prayer, realizing God's the source. That's true Rosh Hashanah also, but Rosh Hashanah has another aspect right now, where it is the beginning, the ultimate beginning, and it's the ultimate end. If you tune into that, then you get Rosh Hashanah, and then you're still in for a great year. All right. Any other thoughts, comments, ideas, questions? Feedback? Sort of makes sense. A little bit makes sense. It's kind of makes sense. Nice. Cool. 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 Sorry, that wasn't too uh, too out there.